Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is João Luiz Azevedo. It is my pleasure to work as, as the coordinator, I guess, for, for this session, our plenary session on towards sustainable air transport. Uh, the session actually is it's part of a tradition at ICAS that we have a session with ISABI, and it was supposed to be coordinated by Professor Rick Parker. Unfortunately, Rick could not be with us for, for personal problems today. Anyway, so we have four speakers, Frank Hasselbeck from Airbus, Brian Moran from Boeing, Eric Mengri from Safran, and Ross Dunn from GKN. Uh, the way we're going to work here is that uh, I'll introduce the first speaker, Frank, which actually would be then coordinating the rest of the session. Each of them will talk, maybe 15, 20 minutes or something like that. And uh, please keep your, keep your questions to, to the end, right? At the end, uh, we'll bring everybody back on the stage and then we'll have questions for everybody, okay? All right, let's get on to it. Our, our first speaker then this morning is Frank Hasselbeck. Frank is a senior vice president in Airbus and he's the head of propulsion engineering. In this capacity, Frank is accountable for the end-to-end -end integration of all propulsive and non-propulsive power plants in Airbus commercial aircrafts, including APUs, pylons, and nacelles. Before joining Airbus, Frank spent 25 years at Rolls-Royce. Frank has a doctorate in mechanical engineering. He's a visiting professor at the University of Oxford and he's a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Please, Frank. Thank you. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Joel. Um, as I said, so I will stand in for um, Rick this morning to, to run the session. And um, I thought uh, it needs a little bit of an introduction. Sustainability is in everybody's thought. It's clearly uh, a vital... Uh, a vital challenge uh, for aviation, for, for aeronautical science, and it's also an opportunity. But I thought I'd leave it uh, there and actually let you all read the little article I found uh, on the internet. I think by now most of you will be through it. It fundamentally says that um, two billion tons of uh, coal have been burned, generating seven billion tons of CO2, that's somewhat generating a warm blanket around the planet, and it could be a problem for uh, future centuries and future generations. Quite an interesting article. Let's check the facts. So two billion tons of uh, coal, do they actually generate seven billion tons of CO2? Should be roughly right. Molar from coal is, uh, from carbon is 12, O2 is 32, 32 plus 12 is 44, compared to 12, around about three and a half. Yeah, makes sense, yeah? So we're there, so that is already a factual uh, statement here. Good. Um, it is a little bit of an old type in terms of typewriting, I think, if I look at it. Would you agree? And um, it is uh, also a little bit of a, there's no mentioning of the Kyoto Protocol or the um, Paris Accord or, or any of this. There might be a good reason for it. It hasn't happened yet. This article is from New Zealand, from a small gazette, most likely page eight or nine of the, uh, of the newspaper, the interesting facts for the, for the coffee round or for the, for the beer at the, in the bar, in the pub. So I'll, uh, I'll give you a little bit of an idea. It, is, it was not able to be read by my father. It was not able to be read by my grandfather. But maybe my great-grandfather, if he would have lived in uh, New Zealand, would have read it because it's from 1912. Before the First World War, before the Second World War, before all the industrial sort of rise, and before aviation really started to change the world. So I thought that is a good reminder for us um, that we should have known that something is going on on our planet and that we are, to a small extent, but we are contributing uh, with aviation. So about, um, I think, we won't actually go too much into the facts, but I think it's common agreed that we are about 5% of the global warming is coming from, from aviation. 
about 2% from direct CO2 and the rest from non-CO2 uh, effects like NOx and, and contrails. So that's roughly where the, where the, um, the science is today. So 5% of a global warming problem doesn't sound very much. But we should have in mind some people in the world will see aviation and air transport as discretionary. We should have in mind that of the 8 billion people or near 8 billion people on this planet, only 10%, 12% are actually flying. So if you put all of these numbers together, it starts to be a much bigger challenge for us to actually sort of take this challenge up and um, do something about it. And I think the industry, after uh, the gravest sort of uh, crisis it had in the last two or three years, uh, after the pandemic, after the sort of, uh, uh, sort of global shock, is now really in this sort of um, opening up and doing the restart in a green way doing the restart and focusing on the technologies and uh, not only my company, but I will talk about uh, my company's plans in a minute, but also uh, all the other players uh, in the aviation industry, Boeing, all the big engine makers, they all have understood the message and we're all working on it. It will take time to bear the fruits and uh, what we're wanting to do today with you, uh, with, with my uh, fellow sort of uh, uh, presenters, is to give you an idea of what's going on and why, what are the plans, and then we're open, I think, at the end of the presentation today, so we'll be roughly in, let's say, uh, something like uh, 60 to 80 minutes from now, we'll start in going into an, sort of an open discussion uh, with the audience. So we're, we're happy to then take questions at the end rather than in between. So with that, allow me to switch my hats and um, I go now to the, to the Airbus presentation and um, we'll talk about the title I have, which is Towards Sustainable Aviation, because uh, it's clearly not fully there yet. Uh, we have concept technologies. We really want to get to net zero by 2050. And uh, I choose this, uh, this, this entry picture, by the way, uh, which is a copyright, of course, from William Anders, an astronaut of Apollo 8. It's taken on New Year's Eve, uh, no, uh, Christmas Eve, um, 1968. And uh, I believe, uh, first of all, it's called the, the Earth Rise. You will have seen it. But I believe it's also the time, the first time where somebody actually on the way to the moon saw the planet totally in, in space. And the fact that you are just a good reminder that we're all in this together and we have to do something about it. So. Let's see what Airbus is doing uh, on, its, on its way, so it's a classical disclaimer. And I start with something which is very near-term and doesn't look like sustainability at all, a new aircraft. Well, it's the um, A321 XLR. First flight was, uh, uh, was this year, in, in June. It's effectively an A321 with uh, uh, NEO, with, uh, with some upgrades and some additional tanks, and it actually allows uh, a, a different range, 4,700 nautical miles. It's quite an impressive product. The aircraft it will replace in the market produce uh, or use 30% more fuel to do the same mission. And that's why it is a step towards sustainability because we're actually sort of renewing the fleets around the world by getting new products in there, working on the conventional technology advancements of materials, weight, wing aerodynamics, aerodynamics overall, propulsion, as in, in this case, or effectively making good systems use of uh, available space to actually get range. All of that is a contribution to sustainability. And uh, it's clearly, in terms of the, the market opportunity, is a low risk opener for, for new routes. And it will be in the market uh, by end 23, early 24. So, how is that possible? How does it, did the world uh, sort of um, come to products like this? And why do we actually have something like in 20, 30 years, a 30% uh, fuel burn improvement by seat? Well, you, I, I can't help because I'm a propulsion guy. I will always go back a little bit to propulsion. So I thought I'll do a little bit of, a, of an exercise with you here. What you see in this uh, graph is 
uh, a comparison uh, of uh, the fuel burn per seat, per aircraft seat, uh, over the years, starting with the Comet, with an, uh, with an Avon engine in it, uh, in 1960. And you can see, if you look at the lower curve, it actually, the, the aircraft fuel burn per seat improved by about 70 to 80%. Massive improvement. Why is that? Well, in the beginning, you can see um, as, a, as a stronger improvement, and then it actually shallows up a little bit, but it's still there. It's, it's still very uh, steep, and it's actually there in the beginning. Aircraft got bigger. Aircraft got uh, aerodynamically more advanced. Transonic wings and other things came in. So, um, so that's one. And engines had a massive improvement from the 1960s to the 1980s, 90s. And those two things together gave that, uh, gave that strong sort of uh, decline that we were almost at half the fuel burn uh, already at 1990. And then sort of did the other sort of 30, 40% since then. So that's, that's, uh, that, that's quite impressive. The other thing you can't fail to notice if you look at it uh, uh, and, and squint a little bit closer is that the, the rate of uh, decrease of propulsion fuel burn and aircraft fuel burn is very parallel in the last few years. So a lot of the improvements over the last 20 years have been predominantly done uh, in propulsion. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. But clearly, there are other things ongoing. And my company, for instance, also looks into the wing of tomorrow, so, uh, um, which, of course, is um, you know, a structural and aerodynamic improvement. And we're also looking at future systems to make sure that we're actually having lighter and more sort of uh, uh, direct muscles on the aircraft. If we look at how engines work, well, we all know where we are today, roughly. So we are in the territory of, let's say, 70 to 75% uh, propulsive efficiency and, uh, and about at, uh, 40 to 45 sort of um, thermal efficiency. So if you, um, if you look at this, and this plot is fundamentally just showing the specific fuel consumption on the vertical axis, there is no uh, horizontal axis. It's just spreading out ISO lines of propulsive efficiency and uh, thermal efficiency. Um, what you can then actually see is, in order to get to better engines going forward, you have to do two things. You have to sort of either drive the thermal efficiency up by higher overall pressure ratios and higher turbine entry temperatures or peak cycle temperatures, which has a challenge because they tend to generate more uh, nitrogen oxide uh, emissions uh, and other things with CO2 is going down, the non-CO2 is going up. Or you go and say, oh, let's, let's do uh, more propulsive efficiency, which fundamentally means take more air and accelerate it or pressurize it less. Uh, if, that, if you do this, you fundamentally need more cross-sectional area, more frontal area. The engine gets bigger, the fan pressure ratio goes down, the specific thrust uh, is fundamentally better, lower specific thrust, and you actually have a more efficient product. But of course, then up goes weight, drag, and other things. So both of those things will have limits, and there might be another 30, 35 percent, maybe 40 percent from where we are today in the engine world. But it won't be easy to do this. And, and clearly, that is one of the axes of the normal technology development we're talking about. And we'll come to that in a minute uh, a little bit more. So uh, let's look at the route to, to net zero. So um, if we want to get there, you have the, the normal, if we don't do anything, line, which is the, the, the top of this uh, sort of uh, opening sort of uh, cone here. And uh, then you have about 30, 35% of technology advancements, which will help. That's exactly what I just mentioned, like the A321 Neo XLR, like improvements in, in, in engine technology, improvements in, 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 in system weight or in aerodynamics. Then you can do more on the operational side. We can be more clever in the way we, uh, we do the... Um, the routing uh, of the planes, uh, how we manage sort of uh, the taxiing, the airport uh, uh, sort of uh, areas and so on. And then there's a large chunk, uh, about half of it, coming from what we call sustainable aviation fuels. Well, that's, a, that's an envelope statement. Sustainable aviation fuels means biofuels, synthetic fuels, 
and hydrogen. Those three are all sustainable aviation fuels because they fundamentally help uh, to break um, the carbon cycle of usage of fossil fuels. Because the problem we have, of course, is we're adding CO2 to the planet because we're taking it from carbon, which was then carbon hybrids, which were generated 60 million years ago. If we cut this and take today's waste and uh, um, sort of uh, feedstock or um, hydrogen and some, some, some uh, sort of CO2 captured to actually do some, some synthetic fuel or hydrogen itself, we're clearly actually breaking that fossil fuel element. And uh, last but not least, you have some market-based measures. You could actually do some, some offsetting, but that would be uh, fairly small. So look at sustainable aviation fuel, pretty clear. It's 80% less CO2 than, uh, than using fossil fuel because you still need uh, some energy to, to generate the, uh, um, the fuel. Uh, it is either municipal solid waste, food waste, sugars. With food waste and so on, you, you get into the territory of food, and of course you have 8 billion uh, people today, 9 billion people in a few 20, 30 years. So we will actually won't want, want to be in the competition with food, but waste is okay. But to our understanding, if you look at aviation today, uses about 300 uh, million tons of uh, Jet A1. In 2050, we expect to use about 500 million tons of Jet A1. If you were to try to do all of this with biofuels, you would fail. We believe that about 30 to 50 percent of that could be done with biofuels, and you would need synthetic fuels to actually do the rest. Which means then you have to get a way to get there. And uh, you, you factory will talk about that in a moment. What we also do, of course, is to make sure that we can use these sustainable aviation fuels. Because if you do something like heifer, uh, which is uh, fat acid based, um, you know, you won't have aromatics in there. That means the higher sort of uh, molecule, the, the circular sort of uh, chains. Uh, and that changes a little bit the behavior of the fuel in the aircraft. So in terms of the, the sealing of, uh, of certain sort of uh, fuel systems, the, the gauging of the tanks and so on. But also in the engine itself, if you have an engine of an older standard, it might actually have problems when it's used to be being a normal fuel with aromatics and then later on gets, a, uh, gets the fuel without the aromatics. So that's the challenge. So we have to work on this. But all the engines and all the aircraft of the world today could fly with 50% stuff. It's a blend you can do because you're fundamentally, as long as you stay in the Jet A1 characteristics, that would be okay. But producing that stuff is expensive and it's not happening at the scale we need it. And so we will need regulations to drive this, this usage, otherwise it will not happen because the market is just not uh, adjusting to it. And of course, uh, you have to sort of uh, look at all of this in order to get it 100% usage in the aircraft and the engine, their certification work necessary, and all that is ongoing at our end, and I'm sure also at Boeing's end, together with the engine manufacturers, to make sure that we're getting to that point. So if you look at it, you can summarize Airbus's strategy, and which is also the Airbus propulsion strategy, because propulsion is fairly centric to, the, to this new uh, um, sort of uh, age of aviation has three elements. Drive the technologies of the today's aircraft and the future aircraft as much as possible to reduce the overall energy consumption of doing the transport. Drive sustainable aviation fuel for bio and synthetic fuels as, uh, as much as possible and focus on the one fuel which actually also allows to sort of um, minimize or effectively get negative on the carbon because you're actually not generating any CO2 and it needs less energy to be produced than, than PTL, and that's hydrogen. Of course, that has much more complexities in the usage. So I talked about that. I'll, I'll skip it. It's pretty clear. The engines are getting bigger, UHBR. So uh, we're looking at those uh, together with the engine manufacturers. And of course, we just recently in Farnborough uh, also sort of announced that we are working with CFM uh, on the open fan, so the RISE program, and they will take an A380 and uh, put it on to the left wing um, sort of uh, inner position and fundamentally actually look at the, all the 
aerodynamic and structural integration aspects of that technology, uh, evaluate the, the internal and the external noise, which is quite, quite essential, uh, and, and also the vibration and, and uh, passenger comfort understand the hybrid electric capabilities of this, uh, of this concept, and of course make sure that it actually can be flown with 100% sustainable aviation fuel. That open fan is nothing else than a UHBR without a casing, and an even bigger uh, uh, fan, and, an, uh, and a lower sort of uh, fan pressure ratio. Clearly it needs pitch control and other things in there, but it is high speed capable, so it is factually better than a turboprop and uh, has uh, a lot of interesting sort of uh, opportunities, but also challenges, and that's what we're trying to find out. If we look at the fuels, I've said all of this already, but meth maybe actually helps it a little bit to sort of uh, uh, look at it in more detail. So we have the biomass fuels, the lower carbon power is either direct carbon capture, which is anyway good because we're taking CO2 out of the air, uh, and we sequestrate it, or we use it to produce together with hydrogen PTL, power to liquid, uh, uh, or we do hydrogen itself. So, we also announced a couple of years ago that we will have a hydrogen strategy and that we are f uh, targeting to have the first zero emissions aircraft into the market by the next decade, in the, roughly in the middle of the next decade. And uh, we put some concepts uh, work out and we did some, some more announcements since then. But why do we do this? We believe that hydrogen combustion is, um, is, is, is a viable and, and good way of actually generating thrust. It has a high energy density. It has the challenge of being, even in a liquid state, less dense than Jet A1. So you have uh, some challenges and you have to manage it cryogenic. So it, it means that 20 Kelvin or below. So there are some challenges with it. You could also put it through fuel cells and generate electric power at fairly high efficiencies, but you have to do the thermal management of the fuel cell, and you could then use the electrical power for the aircraft itself or for propulsion if you wanted to. Then, of course, it can be used for synthetic fuel. So there's lots of reasons why a hydrogen economy is the right way to go. And uh, our ambition is to be there by 35. Um, I think we, we believe that hydrogen is definitely there to deliver that ambition. Um, we, have an, we have some concept aircraft out there, and um, we believe it's effectively the right time to do this. And it's, it's already quite a short one. And if you look at it, 2050, uh, I looked that up recently, is only 9,970 days away. It's, uh, it's pretty close, it's pretty close. So we, that you should know that that was very much in the press, so I won't dwell in it too much in detail. We're looking at 100 and 200 seaters for 1,000 and 2,000 nautical miles at, in a turboprop arrangement, a blended wing body arrangement or a turbo fan arrangement. Uh, to be fair, uh, quite honestly, the blended wing body is the least likely of the three, uh, but nonetheless it's there because uh, it, it's worthwhile to study it. Uh, and of course, uh, we have all sorts of actually sort of uh, work to do there on the tank, the storage, the distribution, uh, and uh, the preparation for then effectively getting to the engines. So a lot of challenges, which uh, and we have a fairly substantial team working this. Uh, the other thing we also did is say, okay, so beside demonstrating the, the, the open fan, we can do and we will do another demonstrator. So we have a second day 380. Uh, which we're effectively sort of equipping with a turbofan engine of a, um, of a so it's effectively for CFM product, it's a passport engine, and that effectively will be in, sitting there on a, on a strut off the fuselage of the A380 and uh, will be fueled with, with liquid hydrogen coming from uh, various tanks. And the key there is to understand the hydrogen combustion in the right form, getting an eclipse around the operability of, of the engine and all the challenges on the way. So all of this will happen in a few years from now. So we have, as you can imagine, two large demonstrators ongoing already. We're ramping up the teams. We have since uh, a few years a growing team of engineers on the zero aviation aircraft. So there's a lot going on. And uh, I think I'll leave it there to give uh, my, my colleagues a chance to, to also say some words. So, so fundamentally, I'll, um, these two platforms will be the backbone uh, of the work over the next few years. 
They will both fly in the, in the um, middle of the second half of this decade. And uh, so we will get, in going towards them, uh, a lot of interesting sort of uh, knowledge and facts which help us to actually prepare the, the actual product. Thank you very much. I'm switching hats and I'm introducing the next speaker. So, Brian Moran. Brian Moran is uh, with us from, from the Boeing company. Uh, so Brian is actually Europe-based. Uh, he's the only non-engineer, so don't give him any hard engineering questions. But I'm sure he actually was around with engineers for a long, long time. He's 22 years with, with Boeing. And uh, he was looking after governmental affairs uh, first in Brussels, then corporate uh, um, affairs and corporate comms in, uh, in Chicago. And he's, uh, I think, based in Amsterdam or close uh, uh, or and uh, sort of uh, list in Europe, and we'll talk about the Boeing way towards sustainability together. Awesome. Thanks, Frank. Well done. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. That was a great presentation, Frank. Thank you. And um, you guys are going to see a lot of similarities between um, how Boeing thinks about the future of aviation and uh, what you just saw from Airbus. And, and you can spot some differences. There'll be a quiz at the end where the differences are. You know, um, connect, protect, and explore the world is, is our mission. And that, that sounds like a slogan, but it really it's what gets the 140,000 of us up every day. And um, Sorry, there's my screen. W you know, it, it says sustainable aerospace together. Could be another slogan, but um, it really fuels us. And uh, about two years ago, our company aggregated all our sustainability activities into one organization under Chris Raymond, our new chief sustainability officer. And a together part is something that I was reflecting on. I talked to Lynn Hopper, my, my friend and colleague, who um, gave a keynote on Monday. And, uh, and this forum really uh, is a fantastic opportunity to share uh, experiences, to exchange views, on the technology roadmaps, uh, on the policies that may get in the way uh, and that need to be informed. So I'm going to try to do that a little bit in the, in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, and then it says everything for zero. Um, at Farmbro, uh, we gave a presentation that sort of aggregated everything we're doing to get to net zero by the middle of the century. And you could just as soon say everybody for zero, because this is a team sport. This is not Boeing against Airbus or, or the other OEMs or against the engine manufacturers. This is very much bringing together the best thoughts and, uh, and leveraging those. So hopefully with this presentation, so you get a flavor of, of where Boeing is going. Um, like Frank, I wanted to start with a quote. It's almost as old as your, uh, as your news, news uh, article from New Zealand, uh, but it's from our founder, Bill Boeing. And um, it's really that second line and the last line um, that inspires me and, and, and uh, you know, the uh, 60,000 engineers at Boeing uh, every day. And that's our job is to keep everlasting at research and ex experiment. And then the last bit there is to let no improvement in flying ever pass us by. And, you know, Boeing, with all humility um, and, and, and uh, frankly, respect for the past, whether it was ushering in the jet age, or, or taking us to the moon, the very picture Frank showed. Um, Boeing has always been there when we had a breakthrough in aerospace. And uh, we look at that line a lot internally to make sure that there's never a moment where Boeing is not part of the next breakthrough and, and, uh, and leap in, uh, in, in aerospace advancement. Uh, since I'm the business major in the room, uh, I figured I'd bring some, uh, some numbers. This is the only slide that, uh, that, that has dollar signs in front of it. Um, but it is important. You know, it, it's easy to get together like this and to talk about um, the technological possibilities, which we should. That's the slide before. You saw it. We will never miss an opportunity to make the breakthrough. But it, the why we're doing it is, is this chart. Um, Frank talked about the 80% of the folks in the world that have never set foot on an airplane. They deserve to, but they, they deserve to, and it's our job, this room, to make it sustainable. You look at the economic activity, aerospace supports $7 trillion in economic activity. Just look at the pandemic. How many of you sat in the comfort of your home, pushed a button, and had whatever the heck you were ordering on Amazon show up the next day on your doorstep, sometimes even the same day? That entire infrastructure rests on the backbone of aerospace, the vaccines flying around the world, the aid flying around the world. 
And then that last, that last figure, 87 million jobs supported. Aerospace is 3.5% of global GDP. Frank said, I live in the Netherlands. That's the same. Aerospace equates the GDP of the Netherlands. So it's an important industry to sustain. Um, we talked about the 2.5%, 3% of direct emissions that it contributes. That is significant, and, and especially since it's growing. You know, aerospace will double over the next 20 years. Again, remember the 80% of the people in the world have never set foot on an airplane. So keep that in mind as a backdrop on, on why we're so hard at work and making aerospace sustainable. So 2050, why, why 2050? Well, last year was a big year. The airlines committed to net zero by 2050 under IATA. We as manufacturers have come together at, at AIA to also say we're going to support our customers on, on that journey. And this year is a really important year at ICAO at the assembly where hopefully countries will get together to set a long-term aspirational goal of net zero by 2050. So the world has sort of snapped the line and said, we got 30 years to decarbonize aerospace. And that, that is tomorrow. That is, you guys know the life cycles and how long it takes. Frank showed some of the aspirations that Airbus has on the product side. 2050 is tomorrow. Some of the airplanes we're delivering today will still be in service then. So think about the amount, of, the amount of innovation that has to come from the next generation of products to offset the products that are going into, into the fleet today. So we have four strategies to decarbonize aerospace. I'm going to quickly walk through that. Now, mindful, Lynn showed a few of these slides, so uh, bear with me if, if it's repetitive. Hopefully, we're in sync on the messaging. I know in the Q&A, well, you'll call me out if I, if, I, uh, if I or she said something different. But fleet renewal. Every generation of airplanes that we put out is about 15 to 25% uh, more efficient than the airplanes they replace. If you go much further, you saw the A321XLR, you can, you can get to the 30s and, and, and higher. But on average, we, we, we achieve about 15 to 25%. And we, and we say that so nonchalantly as, 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 it, as it's, it's taken for granted. This room appreciates how much investment and technology goes into those every 1%. You know, we have an eco-demonstrator franchise that I'll talk about in a second. And uh, we go from big, you know, flying new engines to new aerodynamic configurations to the smallest improvements where we literally had an anti-collision light. Looks like this. And, we, and we, 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 we adjusted the aerodynamics on the light just to get a fraction of a percent in, 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 um, in drag reduction. So we're chasing every little percent. So when we just say, oh, 15, 25, 15 to 25% per generation, that, that's, that's a lot. Um, and it's, you see the commercial airplanes, but uh, the, little, the little fighter jet that you see there is, a, is a, a, a trainer. It's the trainer replacement, the T7, that we actually produce in uh, partnership with Saab, uh, based here in Sweden. And, uh, and on the military side, we also see potential because don't forget when these countries come together to say we're going to decarbonize by 2050, that's not just the commercial sector. That has to be the military too. And so you got fleet replacement in the military, but they, they don't cycle as often as commercial airlines do. So that's where some of the other technologies come in. So the second pillar is operational efficiency. You know, Euro control here in Europe talks about 8 to 10% of inefficiency locked up in the skies because we fly so ineffectively and because of the handoffs between different air navigation service providers. But there's also technology in the cockpits. That, you know, we, we, we have a, a flight deck advisor that tells you and predicts weather based on 10 years of wind history. It predicts what the winds will be uh, the following week on a certain route. And then you can optimize, say, well, I want to optimize for fuel efficiency or I can optimize around speed. But you have the choice. And, and so a lot of the digital capabilities in the cockpit would allow airlines to, to wring out even more efficiency out of their operations. The third pillar is what we call renewable energy, and that is where sustainable aviation fuels come in, and I'll, I'll spend quite a bit of time on that because we think it's the ultimate unlock. Um, but it's also where, as, as Frank said, uh, some of the other carriers, electricity and, and hydrogen, come in, and I'll give you some examples of what we're doing there. And then lastly, it's about advanced technology. It, it, it's, it's really why, why we exist. It's what, what Bill Boeing said uh, more than a, uh, 100 years ago. And um, I'll, give you, I'll give you some highlights there. So, so our strategy is SAF and. Lynn talked about this on Monday, so I'll be repetitive there because it's so important. And, and, and here's why. Frank showed you a chart from the Waypoint 2050 report at, um, that the Air Tra Transport Action Group put together. And the Air Transport Action Group is, is really all the OEMs, the engine companies, 
a bunch of our partners, many airlines coming together and deciding and having frankly been the first sector that actually had a roadmap. You saw that sand chart that Frank showed where different scenarios that we had have agreed on as, a, as an industry. Now, there are different scenarios. He showed scenario three, which had about 50% SAF. If you look at scenario two, that SAF number grows to 72%, and the advanced technology piece shrinks to 12%. But it's somewhere in, in, in there. So, but we know that half of the, of the decarbonization aerospace, at least half, and up to three quarters, will come from sustainable aviation fuel. You see it on this chart. Lynn talked about the tail of 250s. And, and this just puts that in, in, into, um, into sort of a visual, which shows that over time, electric and hydrogen will earn its way onto the airplane. But if you just put a green filter on, the one thing you see is SAF. If you, take the, if you look at it differently and you look at the scale, uh, Frank talked about the, uh, the, the current production. We'll need about 400 million liters by, uh, by 2050. And so as you look at the ramp up, we need to thousand X this uh, production system or this, the, the, the production of SAF. That, that's, a, that's a daunting task. We've de-risked it. It's, it's technically viable at ASTM levels. Uh, we, we can fly at 50-50. We're all working towards 100%, as was explained. Um, but this is an industrial challenge, which is why Boeing has been so active in this field for more than 15 years. We did the first flight in 2008 with Virgin. We helped certify the first fuel, the HEFA pathway, in 2011. In the meantime, we also flew already on uh, a couple of our defense products. You see the F-18 there, which was dubbed the Green Hornet uh, on, on uh, sustainable aviation fuel to demonstrate that um, the military products can benefit from sustainable aviation fuels. And then more recently, in 2018, we were the first to fly on 100% uh, sustainable fuels with our partners at FedEx. That was a 777 freighter. And then last year, we were the first to commit that every one of our products from 2030 onward will be 100% SAF compatible. And Frank did a great job describing uh, some of the, the technical challenges there that we're working through um, on the additives and, and, and the seals, et cetera. We also invested in, in the production itself. We recognize that there are a lot of startups, there are a lot of companies that, that are on the cusp you know, of making it through this S-curve where it's technically viable, but not but not commercially achievable. And so one of the partnerships we launched is with Sky Energy, uh, happened to be based in the Netherlands, but they're um, working on a production site in the, in the Pacific Northwest. And this is as much a production, sort of industrialization challenge as, as it is a policy challenge. Um, pricing right now of SAF is about you know, 2x for HEFA pathways, up to 10x and higher. Sky's the limit really on, on power to liquid. But the 2x is not that bad. And with some of the incentives that we're now seeing, and the U.S. just passed this Inflation Reduction Act, which included a blender's tax credit for, for producers of a buck 20, 25 to a buck 75, depending on the life cycle uh, improvement of the fuel, you can actually get to price parity between Jet A and sustainable aviation fuels. So, so we, we know how to do this. And, and my team around the, all around the globe is very active in informing regulators and policymakers on, on mechanisms and, and policy opportunities to close that price gap. So as I said, it's SAF and, and I, I suspect this room is more interested in the and than in the SAF. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, SAF and, uh, and electric. So we've been investing a lot in electric architectures and you really don't have to look too far and you start with the 787. The 787 has 1.5 megawatt of electricity flying every day on it. We have more than 1,000 787s in the fleet Deliver, been delivering them for over a decade. So we know a lot about electric architectures and, and, and we're, we're, we're taking that learning down into some of the flight, future flight concepts that we're working on. Battery electric, um, and I'll talk to in a second about Cora, which uh, Lynn already teased you with, um, but we're, we're building our own battery system for our eVTOL called Cora. And we're learning a lot there, but batteries, you're, you're very quickly running out of, out of um, uh, capacity and, and, and storage, which limits dramatically the applications that we, we, we can look at for, for civil aviation. Remember the chart we looked at? Uh, and we're really talking two to four passengers, not 50, 100. 
And then fuel cells. Um, they are earning their way onto, onto prototypes, but the problem with there is we, we have dual configurations now where you pay a, a weight penalty and, and you have to really um, understand how uh, you're going to de-risk that over the, in the future. So let, let's talk for a second about Cora. So this is our joint venture with Whisk, uh, with Kitty Hawk, sorry, called Whisk. And Cora is our, for now, two-passenger vehicle. We're about to unveil our sixth generation vehicle in, uh, in, uh, uh, later this month. It's flown 1,600 flights. And uh, let me show you while I talk a, a little video here, which I, I recognize you may have seen on Monday. So. Um, uh, that airplane, 1,600 flights, battery electric, and, and the other thing is it's autonomous. So we're the only eVTOL company that is betting on autonomy for two reasons. F for safety, because once you introduce tens of thousands of these into the airspace, you need an artificial engine that manages that airspace. You're not going to have controllers humanly you know, guiding tens of thousands of these. So you need an AI uh, uh, engine, and we have uh, another joint venture called SkyGrid that makes that possible. But then the other one is, is just cost. If you're adding a, a pilot uh, to, to uh, a vehicle of two, three, four passengers, your business case goes out the window. And so that's why we're investing in, in, in autonomy. Our sixth generation aircraft that we're about to announce is going to be the one that we're going to take to a certification at some point uh, towards the end of this decade. We're mindful of just how much complexity is there. But uh, back to Bill Boeing's quote, we're not going to let an improvement in, in flying pass us by. The other um, um, effort that we announced at, uh, at Farnborough together with GE is uh, we're partnering with NASA and GE on an uh, electric powertrain flight demonstrator. This is a megawatt class uh, electric uh, uh, engine that GE is developing that we're, we, we will do the airplane integration. We're going to do some of the, uh, uh, the software integration, the airplane level configuration and, 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 and analysis. Uh, that is a $250 million contract from NASA. And we're very proud to, to be working with GE on this, uh, another, another Saab airplane uh, on this um, modification, which will happen sort of in the middle of, uh, of this century. So then the second and, remember SAF's the baseline and electric. So let's talk a little bit about, about hydrogen. Again, Boeing has, has, has uh, flown six different franchises on, on hydrogen over the last 15 years. And that, um, from uh, fuel cells to propul uh, liquid hydrogen and propulsion uh, to studying the, the, the cryogenic storage. Uh, we saw a um, very interesting reminder of that last week uh, on the SLS, where just how complex hydrogen is to handle and how leaky it can become. And then the overall airplane level integration. So, so here are a couple of examples. So in 2012, we flew a two-seat diamond. That was the world's first flight um, where the crew, cruise flight was actually powered by a hydrogen fuel cell. A uh, lot of learnings from that. Um, that same year in 2012, we had a 737-800 with an auxiliary power unit powered by uh, a hydrogen fuel cell to test sort of onboard power um, uh, generation and handling uh, of, uh, through a hydrogen fuel cell. And then the thing on the right there is, is called Phantom Eye. Um, that was actually liquid propulsion, and we've, we had several flights uh, on, on that vehicle. And, and interestingly, is the fuselage, as you can see there, is the fuel tank. So, so think about that as we think about future configurations and the complexities involved there. Um, and here, uh, another picture. This was last year. We built a 16,000-gallon um, linerless composite cryogenic tank. Uh, this was a par in partnership with NASA for a space application. But rough 16,000 gallons uh, of, of hydrogen equates to about 3,700 gallons of, of, um, of Jet A, which is roughly what you'd need for a regional, regional jet. And so a lot of learnings there on, uh, on building these tanks. Uh, there are another couple of pictures. If you just go to our website, you can see the ice buildup when we test it. And we tested this to several times its design limit. And, and the good news is the structure uh, held, uh, held, but you can see the ice buildup on the outside. And so we're learning a lot about handling hydrogen and some of the complexities there. And as I said uh, last week's reminder uh, on the leaks that, that, um, that surfaced in the very last minutes pre-launch on the SLS, just remind us of, of it's not just the, the architecture on the, on the airframe, but the infrastructure that needs to be built. And think about last year, you have experts that 
in, in, in space that have been doing this forever, and that is their life, is to fuel a rocket. Think about 33,000 airplanes today out in service, getting refueled every couple of seconds at any airport around the world. And so, so those, are, those are big questions we all have to ask ourselves how to solve. It's our job to solve that. And um, so I'll leave you with this last slide, and, and, and that's our sort of holistic approach. It starts with the products today. I um, had the chance to brief a fairly senior regulator not long ago, and that person, after I was going through the different products in our product family, asked me, well, that's interesting, but where are your new products? And I was, I was talking about the 777X, which again is 30% lower, um, lower emission, uh, lower fuel burn. It has folding wingtips, which is a you know, complete novelty in, in a commercial airspace. And that person said, yeah, it's all interesting, but where are your new products? And I, I reminded that person that the amount of engineering, the amount of investment that has gone into the global partnerships on that airplane have gone into the 777X, which will set a new standard in commercial travel, can't be overlooked. And I think it's, it's on all of us to, to dream big about the future, but then also to bring it right back to the present and talk about what we're doing today. So that's our products today. Uh, on the right there, you see our Eco Demonstrator franchise. We have now, we're in our 10th year of using one of our products or one of our customer products and stuffing it with tomorrow's technology today and seeing which one of these technologies will earn their way onto a future production um, airplane. And we had, we had over 300 of those uh, technologies now. On that particular 777 that's now flying, um, we have, for instance, Deal in, in Germany builds a wastewater recycling um, uh, system. Sounds sort of boring. I don't know. It's, it sounds unimaginative. It's unbelievable because you're taking the wastewater from washing your hands. It's going in the toilet and you're recycling it there. It makes all the sense in the world. It saves you 300 kilograms. Do you know how hard you guys, we work on chasing 300 kilograms in an airplane? And they're doing it through a recycling system on the water. So we're flying that now on that airplane with the hope that to, to introduce that into a production system someday. Uh, but then also we're flying, you know, aerodynamic improvement, la natural laminar flow, you name it. And, uh, and it, it, it's, been, it's been a really good franchise for us because it shows regulators, it shows customers that we're actually reaching and that we're taking tomorrow's exper experiential technology and uh, uh, putting those on today's airplanes. So then if you go to the lower left, um, we're also working on future demonstrators. And uh, the one you see there is the transonic truss brace wing. I don't know if that's come up yet in the presentation, but part of the Sugar series with NASA, uh, where uh, we're going to test all kinds of new structural improvements, aerodynamic improvements. And that's a, that's a competition for a demonstrator that we're, uh, that we're very focused on. And then lastly, we're, we're uh, looking at future flight concepts. That happens to be a um, sort of 50, 60 seat uh, turboprop uh, uh, um, uh, airplane that we're designing internally. That doesn't mean we're going to build it um, because we're literally going through the cycle first of understanding the te technology. And in some cases, when we, we literally have charts that look at how many Nobel Prizes away are we from battery technology being ready. And, and, and the answer is not always zero. Uh, so so there, we're looking at the physics of can you do it? Second question is, can you get it certified? Just because you can do it, can you get it safely certified? Because one thing is clear, we will never go back on our safety journey because the next airplane will have to be as safe or safer than the airplane they replace. That's a given. And after those two questions are answered, you ask yourself, should you do it? Just because you can do it, does it make any business sense? Can you introduce it into an ecosystem, into an airport infrastructure, into a global infrastructure? Will there be enough green hydrogen? Um, because the other thing that we've been very focused on, and we announced a tool called Cascade at Farmbro, which allows you to model sort of the total life cycle impact of all these different levers of fleet replacement, operational efficiency, renewable energy, and advanced technology. And you can play with, well, what's your assumption on the electricity grid? Just because you can do a Cora, like we, uh, um, an ele a battery electric airplane, are you going to have the green electricity available? Or is it going to be electricity from a coal-fired power plant? And you're actually going back in terms of its total life cycle impact on the environment. Same thing with hydrogen. Is this green hydrogen we're talking about? And I, uh, that's the only answer, by the way, because otherwise we're, you will literally see 
any improvement and in, 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 in efficiency completely eroded because the, the life cycle impact uh, isn't clean. So those are the trades we're, we're making right now. It's exciting work that Brian Yutko and his team, uh, Mike Sinnott and others at Boeing are leading. Um, and I'll leave you with that. I look really much forward to the conversation and uh, hand it off, I think, back to Frank, who's going to put one of the hats on and hand it off. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank Very you. good. Thank you. So uh, just a quick uh, change of uh, personnel. So we uh, leave the air uh, aircraft world and go to engines. So our next speaker is uh, Eric uh, Maigri. And he's uh, from Safran. And Eric, uh, Eric joined um, Snecma 1987, yeah. I think. And interestingly, actually, his first job was to work on the integration of an engine called GE36, which was the sort of ungeared, open fan sort of uh, pusher configuration. And um, so from there, he actually then went, worked on uh, the CFM 56 a lot. Uh, with, uh, with Airbus and with Boeing on the A340 and the um, 737. Uh, thereafter, um, became the chief engineer of the um, Leap uh, 1C for the, for the Comac aircraft, uh, and then joined uh, the chief engineering of uh, research and technology about five, six years ago. And he will talk about uh, the Safran approach, the engine maker's approach to, uh, to sustainability, and I'm sure he will talk about the CFM RISE program as well. So, Eric, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Oh, good morning, everybody. So, so you will see in the in this Safran presentation many things that were already said by the two airframers, and that's, I think, a good sign that we are aligned. Uh, even if we have some difference in figures, I guess the, the basic of the plan is quite the same. And I will try to focus on, the, on what we are doing in Safran uh, with our G partner uh, for the short-medium range uh, application future application in order to, uh, to reach the uh, neutrality in uh, carbon dioxide by 2050. So here you can see that uh, on, the, on, the, on the top left of the chart that uh, the, the, um, the four players are the same that was presented by Frank. Um, we, we we consider at Safran that uh, we need all those things to reach the neutrality by 2050. And if there are some others that will come, uh, they will help to reach the target. Um, the aircraft part, uh, what we call ultra-efficient aircraft, uh, is a, a bit larger than what we that, that was presented by, uh, by Airbus. But generally speaking, uh, we are on, this, on the same game. And, and engine is playing a, a great role in reducing the, the uh, contribution to carbon dioxide. And what is important, I guess, is this uh, target is for us reachable without decreasing the traffic. Uh, as you can see, uh, if we uh, succeed to have all those players in, uh, in time, uh, the level of uh, carbon dioxide uh, releasing by the aviation in the air will, will stay constant uh, from 20, 25 up to 2050 uh, to get the, the zero CVD. Key points, uh, electricity, we, we, that was just uh, mentioned by, by uh, Brian. Um, for short medium range, we do not consider that uh, electric, full electrical aircraft is applicable. Just to have some, some rough figure in mind, um, power density of the fuel today is uh, about 12 kilogram, uh, 12 watt, kilowatt by hour per kilogram. The, uh, Better density, power density of the of the battery today is around 200 watt per hour per kilogram. So, so even with great improvement of the power density, we do not see how uh, a full 
uh, electric aircraft uh, will be applicable for the, for the short medium range. Anyway, uh, we consider that it can play a role and, and contribute to the uh, ultra efficient aircraft. Um, future air engine will be for sure compatible with SAF. Uh, it's already the case for the CFM product. Uh, all the CFM and LIP product are certified with 50% uh, of SAF. We, we, uh, we aim to, uh, to reach the 100% uh, in a shorter time, and we are working for this. And, and what is key, and this is the, our DNA, uh, we need to work on the technology and see how to improve the, uh, the uh, SFC, specific fuel consumption of the engine by itself. So the, the, um, the bottom right of the, of the, of the chart presents a, um, a, a rough dry diagram of uh, how the, um, the, the contributor, the main contributor to the um, uh, SFC uh, are, um, are playing the role. Uh, we have two main contributors, the, the core efficiency, I would say, with the overall pressure ratio. And we can see with the, uh, with the current product that, uh, that we are reaching a kind of asymptote. It doesn't mean that there's no more progress to do and we are working this. But gaining some, some more persons on the uh, overall pressure, pressure ratio will be uh, harder tomorrow than it was in the, in the, in the past. Um, keep in mind that with the CFM and the LIP product, uh, the two main uh, uh, SMR engines that were introduced uh, in the band of, uh, of CFM. Um, we have improved by 40 percent, roughly so 40 percent, the, um, the fuel consumption of the, in the engine for the, for the short medium range aircraft. The other player is the propulsion efficiency and, and uh, it's go with the bypass pressure ratio. So w this is the, the, the way we work, and I will try to, um, uh, to present the, the way of thinking and how we move from ducted to inducted engine to reach the 20% minimum uh, improvement in, in uh, fuel consumption that uh, we consider is needed to reach the part of ultra uh, efficient aircraft uh, you have seen in the previous chart. So theoretically, uh, if we've ducted engine, if we increase the, the bypass ratio and we continue to increase over the, the, the level, the current level we have today, which is uh, above, uh, close above uh, 10 for the more recent engines, um, we, we, we will continue to uh, improve the SFC. Uh, we have worked this uh, through the uh, ultra uh, high efficiency um, propulsion that was um, studied by Safran in the, in the frame of uh, Clean Sky 2. Um, but after working the technology and assessing the, the, um, uh, the potential of the, of the configuration, uh, we reached the conclusion that uh, reaching 20% SFC was not uh, the, in the potential of this engine. We we'll try to move forward and, and, and see if increasing again the, the, the bypass ratio with uh, an alternate configuration, which was called the, the VPF or vari variable pitch fan. Uh, so it means reducing the nacelle uh, and, and addressing the, uh, the reverse function through uh, the fan blend pitch. Uh, we can send some few, few percent more, but again, um, the potential to reach the 20% was not there. And the reason for this is mainly represented in the, in the upper layer of the, uh, of the diagram. Uh, even if on, on the engine itself, we save some, uh, some percent of SFC, uh, the drag and the weight of the, uh, uh, of the nacelle uh, overbalance the benefit. So that helps us to, to reach the conclusion that to, to, uh, to uh, meet the 20%, we need to remove the, uh, 
the, the, the nacelle around the fan. And that's what we've done with the counter-rotating open rotor. Um, I, will, I will come further in, on, on, this, uh, on this application. And, and now uh, we, we consider that the, the best candidate and the champion for, uh, for the, the future engine is the, what we call the open fan, which is an evolution in technology uh, from the core. What was the core? The core was, was uh, an engine uh, designed, manufactured, and tested in 2017 uh, in the frame of Clean, Clean Sky 2 with some partners that are uh, listed around there. You can see uh, uh, GKN, um, Avio for the power turbine and the, and the reduction gearbox. So it was a uh, um, uh, a kind of puller configuration with two rotating uh, uh, blades, propellers uh, at the rear. Uh, this demonstrates that we can save 15 persons uh, with the configuration. Um, so it's on it's on the good uh, way to uh, to reach the 20 persons. Um, but we, we, uh, we also realize, working with the airframer, that uh, this configuration uh, has some limited uh, potential in terms of installation on the aircraft. Uh, studies made by, with Airbus leads to uh, uh, the, the, the best configuration was to install it at the rear of the fuselage. And that was not the, the, uh, the way to, um, to, to save the, the, the larger SFC uh, with the, the counter effect of this installation. Anyway, the, this engine was tested about 80 hours uh, in 2017 in our uh, open test center in East, uh, south of France. Uh, and we tested in direct mode and reverse mode. So enough tests to, uh, to uh, secure that the architecture was safe and applicable. And that's what we have used to, to, uh, to move to the next step, uh, the one we, uh, we are working for uh, uh, some years now, and that was uh, officially launched with our partner G General Electric uh, a year ago, which is the rise for revolutionary innovation for sustainable engines, uh, which is uh, still an inducted, inducted fan, but simpler, uh, which, with um, uh, a puller configure configuration. Um, and so with, with um, a better way uh, to be installed on aircraft, you can see on the, on the right of the, the picture that uh, all the configuration can be uh, studied with this. This configuration will use hybrid electric uh, uh, as a, as a complement with some other uh, high advanced systems, and it will be 100% uh, SAF compatible. That's part of the, of the, um, uh, of the initial spec. Let's see in more detail what's the configuration today. So it's uh, only one uh, row of uh, propeller blade. Uh, with a pitch mechanisms, uh, with on, on the rear a fixed row of uh, fixed uh, a row of outer guide then uh, with also a pitch mechanism, uh, and we can find on the on the uh, core part of the of the engine uh, some similarity with some other configuration with the high speed LPT high speed LPC uh, and the reduction gearbox between the LPT and and the uh, propeller that provide the, the more efficient uh, contribution for the for the two modules. Um, this, this is our best configuration, and this uh, configuration is uh, roughly over a bypass ratio of 70, uh, which is uh, significantly higher than the one we have on the ducted configuration that are currently flying. So we have been working this configuration for uh, quite a long time using some uh, technology that were uh, in preparation uh, on, on both sides of the partnership, on G side and on Safran side. And, and we have built a plan to mature the technology with the, the I would say, the legacy steps, uh, mature the technology by itself, uh, then uh, mature the technology together uh, at the engine level, 
on ground, uh, testing on ground, and then testing on flight. So, so those steps are on the way, and you can see some illustration uh, picture of some tests that are either already, already done, we have already tested the, um, the LPT uh, high-speed turbine uh, this year, and some that are in, in preparation for the, uh, for the open fan in the wind tunnel that will come soon beginning next year. So we have a, a, a large plan, uh, 150 plus tests that are uh, scheduled in order to make sure that we mature the technology uh, in parallel with the uh, uh, design and the, ma the uh, manufacturing of the uh, engine test that will be tested by, by the mid of the decade. With the, the, uh, the test, by the test we, we also use simulation, and, and this configuration has speci some specifics uh, that are uh, uh, roughly represented in, in this picture. So we need some uh, high fidelity aeroacoustic um, uh, simulation. Uh, this is uh, lattice Bosman uh, configuration that we are used to, uh, uh, to assess the aerodynamic efficiency of the propeller and the acoustic effect. Um, first step was, was to, uh, to understand how it works uh, isolated and, and quick, quickly we, we, uh, we consider that if we want to have the uh, SFC benefit of the engine uh, at the aircraft level, we will need also to, to integrate the, uh, the uh, effect of the aircraft in the design of the propeller. Uh, and, and I guess next chart is illustrated this. Um, we, 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 for this configuration, the, um, the larger of the, of, the, of the diameter is uh, much higher than the configuration that are flying today. So either the configuration of the, of the aircraft will evolve uh, uh, to be compatible with the, with the uh, larger diameter of the, of the engine, and that's maybe a high wing or a specific uh, shape of the, of the low wing, or um, we will have some interaction between the, the, uh, the, the flow coming from the propeller and the wing with some blowing wing or, or whatever. So anyway, if we want to transfer the SFC benefit in fuel burn benefit, uh, it's clear that we need to work with the, the air framer and to, co and to work together in order to get the, 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 the right benefit of the configuration. And in our plan, uh, we will fly on the uh, Boeing 747, the FTB of GE, and as mentioned by Frank, uh, we agree to, to fly on the F A380 uh, also. So it's, it shows how closely CFM is working with the FMR on the configuration uh, in order to get the, uh, uh, the best result. Few words uh, that was already said, but uh, just to, to highlight that yes, we are teaming together, uh, working on the SAF side. Um, SAF is a, a big player also in the uh, in the carbon dioxide uh, reduction, and and so we already tested some engine with 100% SAF on ground on flight. Uh, the the, the Key question on the SAF will be uh, which SAF. Uh, as it was said, there's many options to produce SAF. There's many uh, chemical composition of the SAF. So we need to, uh, to understand what are the effects, effect of the aromatic on, on the systems, and to make sure that our future engine uh, will be 100% compatible without any detrimental on the engine, whatever uh, life duration or, uh, or uh, MTBF, mid time before filler on, on the equipment. So that's, that's key. Second part of the, uh, of the, of the path to, uh, to uh, zero emission is the uh, hydrogen. Uh, it was already said as well. Uh, we have a plan to uh, to, to fly with Airbus on the Passport 20 and to, uh, uh, and to develop uh, the configuration that could be uh, uh, used for the, uh, for, for the future. Um, in our plan, we consider that if it comes sooner, uh, it will be, it will be uh, welcome, I would say, to, uh, to help to, uh, to reach the, the target. But uh, our plan is not using in the short term uh, the hydrogen uh, to reach the uh, reduction of the, the, the carbon dioxide. 
So just a, a, a conclusion word, um, key technology is what we've done in the past. As I said, uh, uh, we have already with the two CFM in the 80s uh, and, and the, the LIP more recently provided about 40% of uh, SFC reduction. Uh, we will continue to work the technology which is key uh, to reach the uh, neutrality. That's the uh, uh, Safran and CFM view. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. <coughs> yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, very good overview. Thanks very thank much. Thank you. So, we come to the uh, last speaker in this session and then we open up for, for questions. Everybody will come back on to the podium. So last but not least, after having two uh, aircraft manufacturers and an engine manufacturer, sort of would be good to have a, a first tier supplier to the, to the industry talking as well. And uh, for that, we have the CTO of GKN here. Uh, uh, it's uh, Russ Dunn. So Russ uh, actually is an, is an old colleague, uh, if I would have been in Airbus at the time. He was 17 years in Airbus uh, and um, in his career took, for instance, the wing of uh, the A350-900 from cradle, so from the, er the, the early ideas to certification. And after that, in 2013, he then effectively sort of uh, was enticed by, by a really interesting sort of new challenge to, to join the leadership team of GKN, which he did uh, as uh, the chief technology officer, and he's actually holding that position since 2014, and he will talk about the, uh, the journey of uh, GKN towards uh, sustainability. Russ, off you come. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. I am desperate for some water just before I start. Sorry, just two seconds. So. Hopefully my slides will get up on the screen as I drink. Um, so first of all, just to introduce myself. So as Frank has already said, CTO for GKN Aerospace. Um, and I thought before talking about the technology um, opportunities in front of us, I thought it'd be useful just actually to start from a more personal perspective. And uh, what is it that's driven me um, as the CTO of GKN Aerospace to start getting involved in sustainability and some of the technology in front of us? Um, I've always been quite environmentally aware, um, very, yeah, I'd say almost slightly obsessed uh, with environment. Um, and over the last few years, uh, probably three years ago, I came to the conclusion that whilst driving an electric car and uh, you know, recycling at home was all good, positive stuff, the biggest impact I could have uh, and the gearing on my time was if I applied that same principle and thought uh, to my job and felt that I was in a relatively unique position you know, to be able to apply that gearing both for our company, GKN, but also hopefully to also uh, inspire and enable uh, the industry as a whole. So that's what really drove me. And I guess um, what we're going to talk about today um, is starts with that sustainability um, side. So this is something I care about. Um, and over the last few years, you know, I guess all our friends and family have hopefully started to understand that this isn't just something that um, scientists are talking about. It actually has real consequences. Uh, and the startling truth we've seen around us, and I think you know, we've seen and heard uh, stories from around the world of, of heat waves, um, droughts, uh, all sorts of various uh, environmental uh, implications that hopefully make us all stand up and realize uh, this is real. Uh, and and the, the things that we're here to talk about have real consequences and, and they are important. And from aviation point of view, you know, we talk about two to three percent of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, but the startling truth is, um, whilst, yeah, and, and Frank alluded to it earlier on, a relatively small number of people on the planet are actually able to enjoy the benefits of flight. Uh, and for those of us who are in the luxurious position to be able to do so, um, sitting on an aircraft is one of the most highly emitting uh, sort of times of our lives compared to other things we do. So yes, it's a small percentage overall, but it's also an important area to focus on. So if we start with, you know, why, why is aviation? How does aviation contribute to emissions? Uh, we talk about carbon dioxide and two to three percent of global emissions. Um, and hopefully, if we get past the sort of current um, financial position in the UK, I'm not going to mention Brexit, um, shit just did. Um, the, um, the reality is, you know, hopefully 
the world will come out of this recession um, and start to move more to, pros to prosperity. And with that, the aviation industry and the sector will grow uh, accordingly. So with that growth, um, if we don't do anything else, uh, carbon dioxide emissions will grow as well. However, um, as alluded uh, before, um, carbon dioxide is only one part of the story. And I know that there are various different studies going on around the world around non-CO2 non emissions. Uh, but if you, um, you know, take uh, the most uh, quoted sort of numbers, then CO2 is only about a third of the overall impact of, uh, of um, aviation on the environment, with NOx contrails uh, contributing significantly as well. Um, so what that means is for aviation, whilst we start with 2 or 3% of carbon dioxide, uh, when you factor in the other contributions, and then you look at the hopefully the growth in aviation over the next couple of decades, and also then consider the significant work being done in other industries to decarbonize. Um, if we stood still, we would become a very significant contributor uh, to global warming. And of course, we're not going to stand still. Um, so, what are the options? Uh, and I think you know, we've already mentioned a number of these, but I'm going to look at it through a slightly different lens. So the easiest option, which has been mentioned several times, clearly is to take kerosene as a fuel, uh, which is fantastic, you know, works brilliantly. Um, however, does have the environmental impact. And replace it with something that looks like and smells like kerosene, um, a hydrocarbon that can be used and uh, either mixed or hopefully fully replace uh, uh, the kerosene on the aircraft. And, um, and as already mentioned, you know, so you don't dig up fossil fuels, you just simply either directly or indirectly uh, take carbon out of the atmosphere. And that gives you a great benefit of not adding additional CO2, but you still have the NOx and contrails effects. So still, still an issue that we need to tackle. So the other option, um, again mentioned earlier on, is you can swap uh, the kerosene or the SAF um, for something like hydrogen. So hydrocarbon without the carbon. Uh, which means that you don't have any carbon dioxide uh, in the emissions at all. And you can still burn hydrogen, as mentioned, um, and burning hydrogen in a relatively conventional suck, squash, bang, blow type architecture um, is still feasible. Um, that reduces both uh, carbon dioxide, eliminates carbon dioxide, removes um, uh, that, but also reduces NOx and contrails. So burning hydrogen is certainly a, a further step um, improvement environmentally. Or alternatively, you can use that hydrogen through something called a fuel cell, electrochemical, chemi electrochemical reaction, uh, which removes all NOx and carbon dioxide. And also, uh, because you have the ability to decide how and when you uh, dissipate the, fuel, the, the excess water out of the aircraft, you can also do something to manage contrails. And finally, on the very right-hand side, um, you've got batteries. I'm very conscious of something I read about California and their uh, huge uh, increase in fossil fuel burning in order to feed their, na their electric grid for their electric cars, which sounds completely mad. Um, yeah, the reality is if you can actually generate electricity using renewable um, sources, um, then battery can be fully electric. But as already mentioned, power density of batteries has huge uh, sort of boundaries limitations. And so beyond commuter jets, probably not something which we can see going much further. So there's lots of different technologies that are available. And GKN Aerospace um, also fully agree with the roadmaps that have been shared. Um, and we are supportive and working on a number of the programs that our customers mentioned uh, that we believe will help us on this overall journey. The one I'm going to particularly talk about today is hydrogen fuel cells. But I thought before um, talking about the specifics of what we're doing <coughs> and the sort of unique challenges that that offers, uh, I thought I'd just sort of redate to myself, um, and I'm glad nobody else has, has talked to this, and hopefully this will be uh, sort of clear uh, for you here. Yeah, why is hydrogen particularly a challenge and why is it, um, why is it an opportunity? But if you, so if you start with the very basics, if you take a single litre of kerosene to get the same energy on a, as a litre of kerosene, you need about 1,000 litres of hydrogen gas. Um, and so unless you're going to uh, fly in a big airship, uh, the reality is that doesn't really work. So the option then, obviously, is to compress hydrogen. And you have seen flying demonstrators around the world using compressed gas. So you can take your 1,000 litres of hydrogen, and you can compress that down to about 6 litres, which takes it to about 700 bar. That is an extremely high pressure, 
um, and extremely high pressures take very big, heavy cylinders. Uh, and as all of you will know, weight on an aircraft is not a good thing. Um, the alternative is that you can cryogenically cool that hydrogen. So hydrogen has a boiling point of about minus 253 degrees. Um, so if you can take it down below that temperature, it becomes a liquid. And liquid hydrogen, again, you can get that same um, one liter's worth of energy into about four liters of hydrogen. Now, that doesn't sound great, <laughs> if, you, if we're honest. You know, space on an aircraft can be a premium. Um, so whilst there is clearly the opportunity to eliminate all of the emissions that I talked about on the, on the previous slide, um, and certainly using you know, very sophisticated uh, cryogenic storage tanks, it is possible to um, offset the weight increase of those tanks because the weight of that hydrogen only weighs about a third as much. The reality is space is a premium and these are more complex. So there are some big challenges with going in this direction. However, if we are going to use hydrogen, our view is liquid hydrogen offers the best overall solution moving forward. And I don't think any one of our customers have, uh, have uh, considered something else. So that's hydrogen. Um, and if we then talk about hydrogen fuel cell technology, um, actually, before I, go, before I talk about that, um, I did want to talk about why GKN. What is our role in this journey? Because um, as, as explained at the very beginning, um, we don't consider ourselves a supplier necessarily. We consider ourselves to be more of a partner. Um, however, we do not, we're not an OEM. Okay, we, we have um, history of being an OEM, um, both through our Fokker arm and also um, here in Sweden through our business and we have the uh, the OEM responsibility for the Gripen RM12 engine. But looking forward, we're not an OEM. We, we don't have an aspiration to be an OEM. However, we do have a really clear mission as a business, which is to be the most trusted and sustainable partner in the sky. And each one of those words means something to us. In order for us to consider ourselves to be the most sustainable partner in the sky, you know, we need to understand what our vision of the future looks like. What is it that we think people, mankind, needs to do in order to tackle climate change? What is it that we think people will then require um, from aviation? How will that influence government policy? How will that influence our customers to decide what they want to do? How will those influences turn into platforms? And how will those platforms turn into their requirements for solutions, systems, parts uh, from their supply chain? And ultimately, through this journey, we developed our strategy uh, for hydrogen electric propulsion. And our plan is to take our design solutions, which I'll talk about in a second, um, through the demonstration that each of those pieces does what we think it needs to do. Um, and at a system level, on a ground-based demonstration by 2025, prove that the system is able to achieve what it needs to do. And the reason we do that is all about influencing our customers' decisions. Hopefully, we can inspire our customers with what we've done and give them increased confidence to take the bold moves that I know they're going to make in terms of the next generation of aircraft and, and propulsion systems. Hopefully, by gaining their trust and the credibility of the work we've done, we may also be able to partner and be on that journey with them. And ultimately, through those activities, uh, we can enable zero emission flight for all. So. What is a hydrogen electric uh, propulsion system? Um, really, really basic fundamentals. You take your liquid storage, you take your hydrogen into your fuel cell, uh, you have a, an electrochemical reaction that splits the protons and the electrons, enabling electric current with a byproduct of water. The electric current can be used for, amongst other things, electrical motors, uh, which you can then power to create thrust, and hooray, you've got an aircraft flying with zero emissions. So the fundamentals of hydrogen electric propulsion are pretty simple. Um, however, we've set ourselves some perhaps slightly more challenging goals, not that these things aren't challenging enough, um, but I guess when we go back to that, that picture just a second ago about what we're really trying to achieve, fundamentally we're trying to achieve two things. One is we want to inspire, enable, and and uh, achieve a significant reduction in the envir environmental impact of aviation. And to do that, the reality is you need to push scale. Working at a commuter-sized aircraft is, is not going to have 
an impact. The greater the scale of the product's size pay payload range, the bigger the impact we can have. We also want aviation to continue to be accessible for all. The worst thing for us, I think, in this room is if we develop technologies which are so complex and so costly that the cost, the seat mile cost for our passengers goes up and people around the world can't, uh, you know, can't enjoy the benefits and we won't see that growth in air travel that we're expecting. So we want to be able to achieve solutions which drive scale and also technology that enables a more cost-effective use of hydrogen electric. And that's really driven uh, the selection of our key technologies. Starting with the storage. Um, so when we look at our storage systems, we've seen examples already, and we've certainly seen examples for demonstrator aircraft and for, um, for rockets uh, using hydrogen storage. So cryogenic storage certainly exists. The real challenge is to get, you know, find the right combination of materials and design concepts which are going to enable both the optimization of weight, required and important for the aircraft, but also to ensure that um, a solution, rather than one that gonna, is going to go up in the air once or go up in the air you know, a couple of times on a demonstrator, is resilient over 25 years or potentially you know, 30,000 flight cycles uh, without leaking, um, retaining its resilience. And also, that solution has to be fully integrated into the aircraft. How do you maximize um, the amount of uh, fuel that you can carry whilst minimizing the detrimental effect on passenger um, volumes on the aircraft? So how do you integrate those shapes? Does that move you away from classic cylinders into non, you know, less, more conformal shapes with the aircraft? So these are all the studies that we've been doing on hydrogen storage. Um, I think it's fair to say um, the further we dig into hydrogen storage, the more complex and the more challenging we see this as being. Um, but once you've got your hydrogen stored on your aircraft, we then move on to the power system um, and fuel cells. And I think everybody's aware fuel cells have been around for hundreds of years. Um, uh, PEM fuel cells, uh, poly polymer exchange membrane fuel cells have been around since the 1960s. Even today, um, those fuel cells have still got an awful long way to go, we believe, in terms of opportunity. The reality is those uh, today's state-of-the-art fuel cells have been developed for a different set of requirements um, than those of aviation. Um, typically, for air, air markets like uh, automotive, um, you're really driven by cost and durability. For aerospace, efficiency is king for, for the fuel cells. Clearly, temperature um, and, and weight are also important factors, but efficiency is king for fuel cells. Why do I say that? If you can improve the efficiency of your fuel cell, then you need to have less hydrogen on your aircraft in order to achieve the same mission. Um, and less volume means less storage, which means less fuel cells, uh, which also drives reductions in weight, as well as giving you more passenger space. So efficiency is a fantastic enabler from that side. But also, the more efficient the fuel cell, the less waste heat is generated out of the fuel cell. Um, and heat is one of the biggest challenges. Thermal management is one of the biggest challenges with, um, with fuel cells. So pushing efficiency up is an, is an essential enabler to, to hydrogen electric propulsion uh, because it enables you to drive those, both those things. So driving you know, improved materials um, in the bipolar plates, in the membranes, in other components of the fuel cell, um, looking at more advanced cooling systems um, and different concepts for the fuel cell, we believe um, will enable us to make some significant improvements in efficiency. And I'll come on to what that means uh, to the aircraft in a bit. So once you've got your electrical power, you've now generated electrical power using your hydrogen, well, how do you use it? And this, is the real this has been the real challenge for a company like GKN Aerospace. We're not an aircraft OEM, um, even though we have some great OEM background and history uh, through uh, Fokker and, uh, and our engines business, as I've mentioned. <coughs> the reality is we've had to actually look at the total aircraft requirements. We've had to look at what uh, the different concepts for the aircraft would be, what the functions for those different parts of the systems would, would be, and therefore, how does that create requirements for an electrical architecture? And we've spent about a year looking at all of the different uh, configurations, concepts, and requirements, and looked at over 1,200 
different electrical architectures in order to down-select to the ones which we thought were most resilient. And from those, we've then looked at how those scale. If we were to push to larger and larger aircraft, which of those architectures still remains um, valid, which of them still remain resilient, which of them have the capability, and which of them also drive simplicity. And simplicity might be a strange thing to talk about when uh, talking about a cryogenic hydrogen electric power system. It sounds quite complex. But one of the things that we very quickly realized doing this study is that using um, what is effectively a distributed power system enables you to actually remove other functions from the aircraft or other um, systems from the aircraft. So using, a, um, using uh, hydrogen electric can allow simplification. And from our electrical architecture, we then look at, OK, so how do you then distribute, how do you then use that electricity? Um, and one of the biggest challenges with moving from uh, combustion to electrical power is the fundamental change in uh, the, the, the power level on the aircraft. I drive a Tesla that's got a max power output of about 400 uh, kilowatts. Even a really, yeah, relatively small aircraft, uh, sub-regional aircraft, is going to need at least a couple of megawatts um, of power. Um, and that's just for the propulsion side, let alone the other functions on the aircraft that I talked about. Um, and when you have that level of power, <laughs> you're typically, with a conventional system, going to need some very big and heavy electrical systems going around the aircraft. Uh, the example on the screen there, a conventional one megawatt uh, cable is about 54, you know, and this is without all the extra braiding and other safety measures that go on top of the harnesses, you know, 54 mil uh, millimeters of cable with seven kilograms per meter. Um, now, one of the fundamental um, challenges with these conventional systems, apart from uh, arcing and other sort of electrical uh, conductivity issues, is that as you put electrical uh, current through a wire, uh, you create heat. And when you create heat in a wire, you improve, you increase the resistance, uh, which then requires a greater voltage to create the same current. Um, the positive thing is the inverse is also true. If we can take the temperature of the wire down to a low temperature, you can reduce, reduce its resistance and allow current to flow with a low, lower voltage. Um, this is well known. Um, if you go down all the way down to, you know, theoretically, all the way down to zero, you can you know, use something called superconducting, uh, where you eliminate resistance. Um, now, that brings other technical challenges. Within GKN, we've turned a phrase um, hyperconducting, which is sort of somewhere in the middle. Um, in hyperconducting, we take the electrical wire down to cryogenic tight temperatures, um, which significantly reduces the resistance of the wire um, and allows us to drop the voltage levels that we're needing to use to operate, but also significantly reduce the amount of um, cabling going around the aircraft. The example here on the screen, you know, that seven kilograms per meter comes down to about 136 grams per meter. Now, I'll put my hand up, but that's slightly misleading, because clearly to get that wire down to uh, cryogenic temperatures, you need to have a cryogen. You need some sort of uh, cooler uh, in order to cool the wire, uh, and that's not shown. But even when you take that into account, the weight of the installed system is significantly lower. Now, on our journey, we actually anticipated um, that the cryogen on, you know, that you're using for your uh, propulsion, for your, you know, your, your hydrogen, um, would actually allow us to cool these, uh, these, these wires. But in doing that study we talked about earlier on, what we very quickly realized is actually that just doesn't work. Um, hy hydrogen, as I mentioned, has a boiling point of minus 253 degrees. As soon as you start actually putting that around electrical wires that are trying to heat themselves, you very quickly get into the risk of phase change. And what you really don't want traveling around an electric aircraft is a lot of hydrogen going from uh, <laughs> liquid to gas um, <laughs> with all of the associated expansion challenges. So uh, we very quickly realized that probably wasn't a great idea. Um, so our concept is actually to use a heat exchanger uh, and, a, and a separate safer medium, helium, uh, which has a much, you know, it stays as a, as a liquid for, for um, sorry, so this is a gas uh, consistently through this uh, through this entire temperature range. Um, so we've spent quite a lot of time working through what the implications of the architectures of the future could be. Um, and we then take that to one further step 
which is to look at, okay, so how do you actually then use that electrical power on the aircraft? And um, using the same principles of cryogenic cooling, we've also developed a concept for a cryogenic uh, electric motor. Um, and our target, as you can see on the screen on the top right, is really to drive a, a very high level of power density at high power, but without significant speed. Um, and we believe that the concept that we've developed over the last 12 months uh, achieves exactly that. Um, the challenge with, uh, with cryogenic motors is that you're <laughs> whilst you really want to cool some parts um, in order to improve, uh, yeah, reduce resistance and improve uh, conductivity, uh, there are other parts of the engine, uh, the motor, uh, that you actually want to not cool uh, because you interfere with the, the trade between electric flux and magnetic flux. However, we believe we've got a concept that, uh, that achieves exactly that, and we're looking to demonstrate that at a TRL4 level in a demonstrator next year. So, bringing all that together, um, we have developed um, an architecture for what we believe hydrogen electric propulsion could look like in the future. Uh, we've developed the individual pieces of that architecture based on what we believe and anticipate the requirements of our customers could be. Um, and we're looking forward to being able to demonstrate uh, the, the capability that that will offer. And I come back to the beginning. GKN Aerospace is not an OEM, um, and we don't have the aspiration to be an OEM in the future. We do believe that hydrogen has the potential for wide-scale um, exploitation. We do believe that, um, you know, certainly below 100 seaters, we believe this technology could enable a transformation towards zero emissions. We also think that fuel cells have got a huge runway. We think the efficiency improvements that are possible can certainly enable us to go on that journey. And the opportunity with fuel cells is, as the fuel cell efficiency improves, you should be able to expand and extend the range of the aircraft. Coming back to what I said at the beginning, why is a tier one doing this when we're not an OEM? We don't make the decisions associated with these aircraft. And fundamentally, it comes back to my very, very first point. I believe that we who have the capability to act also carry the responsibility to do so. And in GKN Aerospace, we have a lot of capability. So our decision is to be bold and to push ourselves forward and to be ready for a position to hopefully inspire uh, and hopefully partner with our customers to enable uh, the route to net zero. Okay, thank you. That's me. Okay, thanks very much, Ross. Uh, just stay here, because uh, could the other presenters come up as well? As we said, we're going to do a little bit of a um, question and answer now, a little bit of a panel discussion with the audience. Ciao will be so kind and uh, direct the questions to us. We can't see you. It's just impossible to see anybody here. So um, you have to fight for the microphone. Yeah, have has to wave your hand, because it's hard to see from here. So Off yeah, you we have, have a question over here, please, in the front row. So, hello, my name is Ramon Lopez Pereira. I work at Safran Engineering Services. Uh, so, my question is kind of uh, so Brian mentioned the safety a lot. Uh, so, let's say taking into account open rotor configurations, which have uh, large blades and unprotected with a nacelle, as uh, mm -hmm. usual. Uh, the safety of the aircraft could be in a way compromised, let's say for fan blade off, a uh, big chunk, one third infinite energy of a fairly large size mm -hmm. could uh, compromise safety of the aircraft in a way if we combine it with hydrogen and we have a tank of hydrogen in the way. Also, we have a flying bomb. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> How how is it uh, uh, considered from yeah. uh, OEMs, uh, both engine side and uh, aircraft side? Thank yeah. you. Okay, so it's, I think I'll start because it's more a question for the aircraft uh, looking at it. So clearly that case is, is looked at. So um, there are several challenges around the open rotor uh, concept on an, on an aircraft if you put it on the wing or put it, even if you put it on the rear. Well, we mentioned uh, noise, internal, external. 
We mentioned the aerodynamic and the structural integration. Uh, the, the, the certification rules and also propeller blade release uh, is an issue. And, uh, and clearly, in all the concepts we are looking at, whether it's um, at the wing or at the back, we're definitely actually looking at reinforcing the fuselage for that uh, sort of propeller blade release. And that's in all the accounting. So if we hear a 20% ambition for the engine, that's an isolated ambition. Of course, there are some things which are going against that, weight increases and, and other things. But clearly, it will be safe, otherwise nobody does it, and it will be safer than the one before, and we're certainly not doing anything which you mentioned. If I can add something from the engine side, uh, we, we are working a, a, what we call a safe life uh, blades for the propeller, and, and we are working together with the agencies uh, to see how to, uh, uh, to have specific rules of certification for this configuration that, that is different from the, the one, as you said, uh, with the uh, decked and, and uh, uh, case retainer we have on the decked engine. So that's also a part of the, of the challenge for the configuration. As said by Frank, there's many challenges. Uh, and, and this is one we are working on the technology side uh, to prevent from any blade release uh, with this configuration. I mean, I, I can just add, um, you know, whilst we're not an OEM, I mentioned we, uh, from a GK Aerospace point of view, look at um, the whole aircraft architecture and we've had to do exactly those studies of what do we think uh, will be required from the engine or the motor, what do we think will be required from the aircraft architecture, how do you ensure that exactly that failure case uh, doesn't lead to a catastrophic failure on the aircraft, where do you need to route things um, in the right direction, how do you prevent, how do you create barriers between certain areas. You know, these are all parts of that fundamental architectural requirement flow down uh, that we've certainly had to look at and I know the OEMs will have had far more experience of looking at. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Hi, Yannick Hesse from the German Aerospace Center. Um, my question is dedicated to Airbus and, uh, but, but also to Boeing. In your presentation, you mentioned uh, that there are also non-CO2 effects that impact the radiator forcing yeah. and climate impact. Uh, and they are a little bit uncertain, but uh, significant. Uh, what is your strategy uh, in order to tackle these non-CO2 effects when the next generation uh, of, of aircrafts are flying with SIF and hydrogen uh, that is combusted in, in uh, gas turbines? Well, I, I can start this. So, so fundamentally, clearly, first of all, we are reducing the fuel consumption overall, which will actually reduce all emissions. Um, so that's number one. So we definitely have less CO2. Uh, we, we keep in effect we cutting through the this fossil CO2 uh, sort of generation. So that's number uh, number two in this equation. Number three is we're clearly making sure that all the combustion processes just keep on being optimized for lower NOx emissions. And also, if you burn stuff, you can actually work for for lower NOx in the in the combustion process. If you burn hydrogen. You need to be careful that you're not generating more NOx. So if you were actually do this unoptimized, you would, but you can do this also in a form that you actually are bringing this down. So, uh, and, and, and last but not least, you have contrails, which is linked to water vapor. There you will have to go for some operational measures as well, because you will have to understand whether you can do something for the flight path of the aircraft, because not in every altitude mm -hmm. you're generating uh, contrails. So you can actually bring measures of uh, humidity, pressure and temperature together. Yeah, and look, it's about testing. It's astonishing how little science we have on contrail formation. I mean, if you look at everything we talked about for the last hour and a half, the, the absence of data in that space is ridiculous. And so we're working with DLR, with NASA, on actually measuring uh, some of the non-CO2 effects. Through our Eco Demonstrator franchise last, week, uh, last year, we did uh, extensive measures with, uh, with NASA on the 100% SAF usage and on what um, non-CO2 effects and emissions uh, result. But we, we, we don't have enough data, so we need to go measure. And you have the Vulcan project here in, in Europe. Uh, we're working with NASA on, on similar projects, but we're behind. And the other piece um, I was talked about is the, the water uh, emissions from hydrogen. I don't know if you've seen a, a test. We had a chance to actually watch one of these engines at, at, at work. It's not, it's not a little, little bit of water. This is it, 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 an incredible amount of water that comes out. 
And um, again, the cloud formation, cloud seeding are, are all areas that sort of in atmospheric sciences we have to double down on. And we have literally, we have a whole weather department at Boeing, as I call them, uh, that does nothing but that. Okay. Is there a question over there, please? Yeah. Uh, my name is Kumar Bhatia. I'm a retired Boeing engineer, remembering working on the 7J7 in the late 80s and facing challenges with the airplane integration with respect to the ultrafan engines, counter-rotating props, and so forth. So what has happened in the last 30 years for us to look at that again and see that we will not have uh, challenges in the aircraft integration? Thank you. Well, I think um, I'll start with, uh, we clearly have more capability. We have learned from the from the past experiments, and it was not only the G36. There was also the uh, the Pat Allison sort of uh, um, sort of uh, open road to concept. We have uh, better ways of uh, um, managing the the vibration linked to this, uh, and um, we are definitely in a in a in a in a position where we also have better ways of managing the noise implications. Uh, for these with the engine concepts. So, and now going to a, to a single open fan with uh, a pitch controlled data behind and just getting it to the right Mach number regime in terms of uh, efficiency, I think is the right way forward. I'm not saying that we can do this. Uh, I'm not saying that the answer is there, but if we don't try, there is no, no other means of actually doing with conventional technology these amount of changes uh, in fuel burn. Just to complement this, um, uh, from, from our experience of the of the core we have tested, we have measured the noise for sure, and and uh, we can compare with with the level we had for the GE36, and uh, that's drastically reduced. Yeah. Uh, what, that's why uh, we 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 have in the plan to reach the same level of noise as we have today with uh, a ducted engines. Uh, with an open fan without any uh, uh, noise attenuators uh, in the nacelle. Yeah, so okay. that's the kind of challenge uh, we, we, we have in the hand, and we are confident that uh, we can reach it through the uh, experience we gain and the high level of simulation now uh, tools we, we can uh, use for the design of the propeller. And the calibration will happen through the flight test, and that actually will give us an idea whether we can do this in the in the in the approach of same passenger comfort with an open fan compared to a to a UHBR. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, hi, Susan Ying from Ampere Electric Airplane Company. But my background is actually uh, fluid dynamics. Uh, so I have two questions regarding the fluid that goes in to the hydrogen airplane and the fluid that goes out. So uh, the going in part, because I see in the configurations that you have, the tanks are in the fuselage. And so in refueling, have you considered some of the challenges in refueling? Because currently the refueling is on the wing from the above, from below. And uh, with all the leakage and all those um, uh, issues, have you considered that? So that's the fluid going in. And the fluid coming out, because uh, you mentioned a lot of water, there's going to be a lot of water produced. And especially when the airplane is climbing out, taxi climbing out, are you just going to dump that water on the runway for the airplane that comes afterwards? <laughs> so, so I'll take the, uh, the first part of the question. <laughs> and let's see who wants to take the dumping one? Uh, so uh, the, the first part of the question, clearly we have looked at, and we're looking at the whole ecosystem of hydrogen. So how do we get hydrogen to the airport? Do we store it there? Do we produce it there? What's the most logical way of actually doing this? How do you manage hydrogen at the airport? We have partnerships set up for all of this. We're looking at the fueling uh, sort of uh, process itself. Of course, that needs to be safe. You have the challenge of actually having something which you want to fill in in cryogenic uh, form. So you need to actually have a pilot before that in order to actually manage the whole situation in a safe way and also in, a, in an inert way. Uh, and you actually have to look at other things like dormancy and so on in, in, in that whole system. All of that is looked at. There's a, there's a huge uh, uh, group of people in, in Airbus looking at all of this with our partners, with researchers, separations, and with, uh, with the engine company. So all of that is ongoing. Uh, to be fair, I never did the, quo uh, the equation of how much water we are dumping, but it's water vapor, first of all. So it's not water where we're throwing out there. Uh, and I assume there will be a, a, an... Um, an answer, but I don't have it. Does somebody have it? <laughs> Maybe I'll 
try and answer as well. Um, I mean, I guess I'll take two parts of your question. So the first one around how you get the hydrogen in. Um, again, we're not an OEM, but in order to understand how um, our system is going to support the aircraft of the future, uh, we've needed to really understand exactly that question. So we've run a program called Napkin uh, in the UK, working with Bristol Airport and with EasyJet um, and other partners, uh, looking at exactly that. How do you actually store, how do you, um, uh, how do you load the aircraft with hydrogen? Uh, what are the particular requirements of the system in terms of venting, in terms of flow, in terms of uh, physical connectivity. Um, so we've been looking at exactly that question through our napkin program. And I think all of the challenges that you, you probably are aware of, I think they're all, uh, you know, they, they are challenges that can be overcome uh, in terms of the architecture. Um, in terms of how, how we use the water, um, in a hydrogen electric uh, system, you have uh, you ha actually have a, a, a reuse for the water in the cooling of the cell uh, as one one of the uh, one of the the uses through a condenser. Um, but ultimately, you are going to need to um, not carry the residual water around on the aircraft with you because that that is uh, is is a huge amount of weight <laughs> that you really do not want to be carrying around. Um, so the reality is, you're going to need to release that from the aircraft during its flight. The challenge, and this is where I think you know um, Brian's comment about really needing to understand the non-CO2 effects comes in. The challenge is to make sure that you can release that water from the aircraft in a way that doesn't have a significant negative effect onto um, onto global warming. And in order for that, we need to understand you know, how to inform and enable the aircraft and the pilot to make those conscious decisions. Because dumping it in one uh, uh, altitude with one weather condition can be really detrimental. Um, in another, it's not as detrimental. Yeah. So uh, it, we, we need more knowledge and understanding. We do believe, and that's the reason why on my chart, it was a bit of a dotted line. We believe it, that we can improve and reduce the, neg the negative environmental effect, but exactly how is still to be decided. Yeah, but we sh should keep it simple. We're doing water vapor today in every Jet A1 engine. Yeah. So out of this comes CO2 and water vapor. So we're just having a little bit more water vapor if we do actually hydrogen combustion. It's, it's, not, it's not like tons of water all of a sudden. Yeah. And uh, Susan, I think you know some of the uh, startups in that space are experimenting with sort of the Nespresso pot concept, where you're rolling on and off, and not refueling as such with a hose. Um, wish them luck, and, and it's 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 creative. Um, as I said earlier in my in my brief remarks, as the main contractor on the space shuttle and now on SLS, uh, we we have a lot of experience in, in just how finicky and how delicate the refueling part is. Be interested in your views on how um, how the infrastructure will work out on on charging um, electrically charging airplanes uh, at pace at these different air, uh, airports. But maybe for for another question later. Yeah. Um. Right. Any more? Any more questions? Over there, please. Hi there. I'm Christopher from Swedish Defense Research Agency. Um, I was thinking about, uh, you mentioned that uh, core efficiency is uh, closing in towards an asymptotic efficiency level. Um, have you considered uh, pressure gain combustion, such as rotating detonation uh, combustor, which would uh, both re re potentially replace the, the conventional combustor, and uh, it has shown a promising uh, more or less three to four percent efficiency increase. As uh, and then as I understand, you can also address the issues with uh, having the NOx issue. Uh, I can do a, give you an answer for my for my past. Uh, clearly, I'm sure all engine companies will have looked at uh, pressure gain combustion. Uh, it, it has uh, some some merits, as you say, and three four percent of cycle efficiency is broadly right, you have the challenge of having to pump up the cooling air in the turbine in order to get it out of the turbine blades. Uh, that's one of the deficits of it. And um, we are, I think all the engine manufacturers are very, very keen to keep the amount of noise and aeroacoustics and thermoacoustics in the combustor currently in today's products to a minimum in order to get durability into this. And pressure gain combustion will have a massive challenge in actually generating a durable 
sort of uh, 30,000 cycles engine. Uh, I think that is the blunt truth where I am. Yes, so, so I confirm we, we at the Safrance Research Center, we continue to work this configuration, but uh, as of today, we haven't seen uh, a way to compromise the, the the drawbacks effect to be a few, few persons challenge that uh, or merit that uh, can provide the configuration. So, so we keep on working and and, and this configuration. But uh, our uh, configuration and the rice co configuration is uh, looking to a more conventional uh, combustor. Uh, we're working the uh, how to to um, manage the the high temperature level uh, needed at some level and the reduction of the NOx by uh, uh, working the configuration and uh, the way we uh, we mix the flows. Yeah. Having said that, I think in with the, the advent of hydrogen and other stuff, there is of course a lot of let's say uh, advanced cycle work still ongoing and we invite everybody to be creative and come up with ideas of how to actually sort of look at the Brayton cycle overall and put an additional one into the mix and so on in order to actually manage that. We're, we're more than open to this. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at the time, I guess it's, we have to wrap it up, so it's almost 10 o'clock. So I'll ask you to again join me in, there's another one, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Thank you. One more? One more, okay. yeah. All right, uh, Henrik Rundemalm, GKN. Hi, Henrik. <laughs> Um, so, we, we talk about hydrogen, and you showed some of the carbon ca capture adding hi hydrogen. So, everything circle around hydrogen, and we know that from other businesses, they are talking about how hydrogen. Yes. So, the question then would be, how do you see the greater society in relation to hydrogen? Will we compete about the hydrogen, or is it actually <laughs> beneficiary? that everyone is working the same track, kind of. Well, how do you see that? I'll start, and I'm sure the, the others have an opinion, but uh, uh, I would love to be uh, in the second part of your, of your question, that it is beneficiary that we're all uh, doing this. But uh, if we look at the energy needs of humanity in 2050, they will be huge, will be a billion people more. Um, today we're using about 2 or 3% of the world's energy for aviation because we're actually taking stored energy out of the ground and converting it. If we want to do all this with renewables and produce it in the appropriate way, I think that 2 or 3% of the world's energy will take up to something like 15-20% mm -hmm. in that territory, so a huge number. And have in mind we want it to be renewable. If we look at today's energy usage, in the world, or energy production, about 15% is renewable, and the rest is coal, oil, gas, and uh, nuclear. Uh, so, um, so you could argue we have a massive societal challenge to, to do that conversion. And we need to be an, a motor for that. Uh, but uh, it would be naive to assume it would be that simple and people will just give us 15% of the world's uh, um, uh, sort of renewable energy yeah. to produce uh, jet engine fuel. Yeah, Frank's point is spot on. I think the com competition for re renewables, especially in this climate as that we're living right now. But the other, the other challenge I see is the competition for hydrogen between SAF and, and, and li using liquid hydrogen on the airplane, because you need hydrogen to produce SAF today. And uh, as we saw, between 50 and 70% of the solution is SAF. And as we're eating into that wedge, um, with all the technical challenges that we still need to solve on hydrogen, we can take our eye off the ball of SAF. The goal is 2050 net zero, that is not gonna move. And so we have, we have to keep each other honest as we burn down on these wedges that we don't start eating into one at the, at, the, at the cost of the other. All right then, well let's, yeah. let's please join me in, in thanking our four speakers again. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess before we close it, I mean we have this brand new ICAS medallion, so I'd like to pass it on to you guys, Frank. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Eric. Thank Merci beaucoup. you. Merci. <laughs> thank you. Ryan, thank you very much. Thank you. Russ, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this, this, closes our, this closes our session. Please enjoy the rest of your day, okay? Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Wow.